And we are ready and we are wanting and needing and hungering, Lord, for your word here tonight. Lord, I pray that you'll uh, give our pastor the meat to feed us, Lord, and that we will receive it and be able to apply it and use it in our lives to glorify you, Lord. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and take your hymnals. Turn to hymn number 281, Never Alone. Hymn number 281, Never Alone.
folks with names. Uh, Janet Akers, Peggy Akers, Willis and Sharon Akers, Beatrice Armel, Grima Bailey, Fred Bailey, Amy Baker, Ed Ballingy, <coughs> Bonnie Barton, Eddie Barton, Nita Beasley, Amy Beckner, Amy Beebe, Cassie Beebe, Cuby Belcher, Nancy Belcher, Mary Alice Belcher, Tommy Belcher, Stephen Bennett, Alvy Blankenship, <coughs> Carol Blankenship, Sheila Bloomer, Todd Broadman, Mary Bennell, Walt Bennell Sr., Donna Bostick, Danny Bradley, Jean Bradley, Tommy Bradley, Patsy Brodus, Bill Brookman, Bob Brown, David Brown, Keith Brown, Sonny Brown, Janice Broyles, Mike Broyles, Sonny Buckland, Mike Butler, and Robbie Campbell. Is there any updates or anything on the first row there? Yeah. Anybody, any additions? Yeah. Berkeley says she's got a couple. <laughs> yeah, all right, we'll go look at the, we'll do the short one and then the uh, third row there all together. Ronald Carroll, Howard Carter, Jeanette Carter, Randolph and Liz Carter, Raylan Carter, Darren Chapman, Larry Cobb, Carolyn Cody, Rick Cole, Jeff Collins, Sheila Collins, April Comer, Tim Cottrell, Madeline Craig, Teresa Craig, Bonnie Crawford, Diddle Dalton, Matt Dean, Kim DeHart, Anthony Dillon, Jimmy Dillon, Robert Dunn, Luke Evans, Don, e Don Everett, Joyce Ferris, Madison Ferguson, Elaine Flint, Harvey Flint, Casey Gillenwater, Norman and Becky Gotze, Jesse Gomez, Benny Gore, Harry Greco, Freddie and Carol Greenleaf, Brian, Ben Gronswick, Gronswick, Bonnie Gineau, Joyce and Harold Halstead, Don Hanna, Susan, Susan Harden, Shirley Harmon, Sequoia Hart, Austin Hatfield, Caitlin Hatfield, Jack Hatter, Shirley Hedrick, Clay Helmick, Jill Henry, Judy Hines, Joe, Joan Holdren, Mike and Maxine Holdren, Jaden Holiday, Jerry Hollingsworth, Larry Houchison, Rita Hunt, Brittany Janey, and Richard Janey. Any on those two guys there? Any updates? surgery tomorrow. Or I, is that right, Genevieve? No, I just go see the surgeon tomorrow. Um, go see the surgeon. When, did you find out when Harvey has his surgery? No, they haven't got back to us tomorrow. Okay. So I'm not sure when that is. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I didn't, haven't talked to him yet. Uh, talked to Mary earlier. Of course, he's just discouraged. He wants to get home, but that was the last that I heard. Everything else is going to be okay as far as I know. Tommy got home about 1 o'clock today. What's that? Tommy Brandon got home about 1 o'clock. Okay, so he got home about 1 o'clock. Good deal. Good. Jesse? Ben Gronswick. Okay. He's had a Kim off. He's been released. He's doing really good. We're excited. Okay, good deal. That's Ben Gronswick. We'll take him off. See you. Jeanette Carter. <coughs> short whisk. She's my cousin. and She's doing better. We can take her off. Okay, praise the Lord. All right, let's look here at the uh, fourth row. Stephanie Jennings, Cooper Jewell, Ellen Spangler Johnson, Mike Johnson, Dorothy Jones, Stan Kin uh, Kin Kincaid, Carol Knight, Leonard and Sue Kowalski, David Lambert, Marietta Lambert, Robert, Robert Lambert, Daryl Lee, Emmett LeHugh, Danny Lester, Wade and Frieda Lester, Rita Lewis, Timothy Lilly, Eddie Long, Grayson Long, Pam Long, Danny Lucas, Kathy Lucas, Stevie McMahon, Eleanor Mann, John Mann, Bobby Martin, 
Trixie Martin, Minnie Meadows, Faye Meadows, Robbie Midkiff, Darla Miller, James Miller, Melvin Miller, Helen Mullins, George Muncy, Roger Pence, Joyce Perry, Louise Petrie, Bobby Phillips, Isles Poindexter, Gina Porter. Any updates or was, uh, on that? Anybody on that list there? Go ahead. All right, Harry. The old Spangler Johnson. That's the problem with fluid right now. But the leg is, is healed, so it's good there. Okay. So, uh, Ellen Spangler Johnson, she uh, got some fluid issues, but the leg is healing up good. Is that right, Harry? Is that way I'm okay. Continue to pray for her. <coughs> um, I think we can take Emmett Lefty off. Um, he still has some follow-ups and things that he'll have to see the doctor for, but he's doing really good. All right. That's good. Nice to see you. Uh, with you. Somebody else on that right there? All right. Let's go to the fifth row right here. Sean Reynolds, Don Richards, Lorraine Richards, Tony Richardson, Nathan Roberts, Pastor Jimmy Rogers, Megan Roop, Dale Scott, Eddie Simmons, Janice Stetzer, Stetzer, Don Schaefer, Amber Shin, Linda Shorter, Jeanette Seibert, Sharon Smith, Betty Snyder, Bonnie Snyder, Brenda Sowers, Jared Sowers, Dan Spencer, Ellen Johnson, Joanne Spencer, Jesse Spencer, Tom Spencer, Mark Stallmaker, Ray Steele, uh, J.C. Sutton, Glenn Trent, Ott Trent, Samuel Underwood, Rita Underwood, Rachel Vance, David Waddell, Rick Wall, Shelby Walker, John Walkman, Barbara Webb, Tiffany Witt, Anna, Anna Weichel, Sandra Wynn, and Jim and Bobby Young. Any on the final row there? I think Walker passed away, but I can't say for sure. Okay. Shelby Walker. Uh, Maybe you might better wait. Shelby Walker, okay. Yeah. All right, and then uh, we can Ray Steele, he's the guy that does our inspection. It does with my inspections. He had uh, cancer in his throat, and I talked to him this week, and he said that he was cancer free. He still had some healing on his throat, but he wanted to thank us all for his prayers. So, so anyhow, uh, any other? All right, go ahead. We got any additions? Go ahead. I have it. Sorry. Um, Amber Shin, um, she's my cousin who's had the stage three colon cancer. We can remove her. She's been for several months now. She's back at um, the Charleston Hospital working as her nurse, and everything's going good for her. So awesome. Yeah. I always think it's crazy. Some weeks she comes, it's like you just add, add, add. <coughs> and then tonight, it just feels like we've got to remove several names. That's a blessing. And, and God hears. Uh, we have Jesse and Mike. Well, somebody had two people had Mike. Oh, back. Go ahead, Mike. The uh, Sager, excuse me, just pick up our on the 19th. Her mom passed away today. Um, Tiffany uh, Sanders. What's that? Yeah, no, Tiffany Michael Wilson Sanders. Um, is it Sue? I don't remember. I don't Sanders, we used to pick uh, Tiffany and uh, um, Michael. Michael, and then uh, James is the other one. We used to pick them up on the church bus and then Mike passed away. Um, Norris. <coughs> and Jeannie Rattler. Okay. She had a lot of problems with the blood, so they had to take out their head. Yeah. Jeannie Rattler. Add her to the prayer list. Using <coughs> blood. G. Rapper. Mm -hmm. G. Rapper. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Brenda? The Sanders girl, the Sanders, that lady's name is Susan. Susan. Susan Sanders. Susan Sanders, okay. All right. Any other additions? You like me, you're trying to go alphabetical order as you get out there and then you forget. So. Anyway, all right. Uh, don't forget our uh, foreign and our home missions and Christian schools on the back, the nursing home ministries, and all that. And continue to be in prayer for them. I'm going to ask Corey if he'll open in prayer and John if he'll close us in. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity here on Wednesday night to come out and come to you with all of our concerns and all the needs that we have in this small community. Lord, you know all the situations on this list and all the many others that. We may have unspoken. And Lord, you know that there are things that uh, all of us have that, you know, that we, we come to you and we continue to know those situations. 
Lord, I ask that you be with each one of them, and, and if your will be that they be healed, that, that, that happens in your time frame and, and in your will. Lord, I ask you to be with the missionaries that are on the back, whether they're home or abroad, that you will give them fruits for their labor and, and help them to get into the situations that they need to get into. Lord, I ask that you uh, will watch over us um, this week and continually as we as we move through the week. And Lord, I ask that you continue to bless this church and ask that you help this church continue to stand for, for truth and for always having the doors open on, on uh, many days during the week. Lord, I ask that you uh, watch over every preacher today and give them the words that you need, need us to hear. In Jesus' name. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us, God. We thank you for prayer, God. To have an avenue directly to you to bring our concerns yes. to you, God, is such a blessing, Lord. I pray for the people on our prayer list, God. I pray that you'll heal. You'll have your will and your way in their life, God. <clears throat> and I pray, God, that you'll continue to bless our church and strengthen our church, God. I pray that we'll always be a church that's mission-minded. Right. God, that we'll always be concerned about spreading the gospel throughout our community and throughout the whole world. I pray for our missionaries, God, for all the Christian schools. God, thank you for the Christian schools in this area, Lord. That we can take our kids to, Lord. I pray that you'll continue to bless them. I pray, God, that you'll guide us and lead us throughout the rest of this week. I pray for Pastor Walt, God, that you'll give clarity of thought, God, as he preaches your word tonight, God, and that each one of us will hear it and we'll use it, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, just a few announcements here to let you know about. Uh, there is a sign up sheet in the vestibule for. Uh, any of you men who are planning on going to the Spring Men's Prayer Breakfast, uh, that is Saturday, March 5th. That's just coming up here two Saturdays, and that will be at 8 a.m. Uh, preacher John will be our guest preacher for that. Uh, let me just ask here quickly, now if you show your hand, I'm going to ask for a show of hands uh, so I can get a rough count, but don't forget to put your name on the list also. How many of you think you'll be able to be at that? Great. And Rick, who's doing the, uh, the, the Food. Preparing the food. Uh, that's Roger and Bali, and I talked to them today, I think it was, and uh, he was wondering if we could get a rough count uh, for that. So, Can you uh, ask them if they need any help? Because I think yeah. that it would be glad, glad to help. Yeah, okay. I'll let him know. I think they're supposed to be back Thursday of that week, I believe. So, <laughs> okay. uh, so I'll let that. We'll I got a CA just got one. <laughs> <laughs> right? I got See, ball and toll. You got ball and toll? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's how it goes sometimes. Uh, let's see, I was trying to think if there was anything else. Oh, this coming Sunday is uh, Berkeley Comer's birthday party. They're going to have it there in the activity building uh, or fellowship all one or the other from two to four. Uh, so if uh, you are able to come to that, uh, everybody's invited. So uh, just make a note of that also. Um, let's try to think here if there's anything else I'm missing. I think that is all that I have for right now. So if I can get a couple of ushers to come, actually, let's do this. Let's all stand. I always like welcoming one another. Sometimes we do <coughs> that, sometimes we don't. Let's welcome one another to our service and then we'll get our ushers to come. <laughs>
those folks who are just good work to have for us for the thing we use them for. Thank you for the names we heard about that we got to remove from our prayer and yes. yes. thank you for those blessings for them. We'll take them. Get this all done and we just stuff this in the next hand. Thank you. Thank you. May you may be seated. Thank you. 
committed. Yeah. And that's what we need. Uh, I saw uh, Dr. Alton Beal had an article that he posted yesterday. I saw, I think, yesterday evening uh, there on Facebook. Uh, it was a Wall Street Journal article. So this is put out by a secular newspaper. And uh, they posted about the shortage of preachers across our country and how so many, of course, there's a lot of people leaving their job. They call it the great resignation. But this is carried over into the church. And it, they were talking about the shortage of pastors and how a lot of people, a lot of men, are leaving the ministry coming through this pandemic. And I thought, Lord, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's been a crazy couple of years. And it'll probably get a little crazier. But, you know, there's something I think that we ought to be determined. We ought to be committed in this day and time. That we're going to finish strong no matter what happens. No matter what comes our way, no matter what uh, the world throws at us, no matter what the devil might try to throw at us, that we're just going to finish strong because we know the Lord's coming back soon. Mm -hmm. He's coming back very soon. So we just need to be uh, found ready. We need to be watching and waiting and loving His appearing. And that's what I want to do, and I hope and trust that's what you want to do as well. Well, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 37. Genesis 37. And uh, this is uh, the beginning of the story of Joseph. <clears throat> Genesis 37, first book in the Bible. <clears throat> Genesis means a book of beginnings. And Genesis 37 and verse number 1 says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph, being 17 years old, 17 years old, he's just a young man, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many collars. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream. And told his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now there's a lot of things we could pick out of this passage here, but there's one thing in particular, and this is the message I want to preach on. There was a problem that Joseph's brethren had with authority. And that's the uh, message is on authority. How do we have a healthy view of authority? We need to make sure that we have a biblical view of authority and make sure that we are looking at things correctly. Joseph, of course, was the 11th of Jacob's 12 sons. He had one uh, brother, Benjamin, who was younger than he was. And here he was, just 17 years old. All of his older brothers are now adults. And he's telling them his dream. And they already didn't like him. And this is not just, you know, uh, sibling rivalry. It's been beyond this point. This is real hatred they have in their heart. And then when they find out that he's dreamed this dream, actually a couple of dreams, and here they have, they were going in the dream, they bowed down to him. They had a problem with authority. You say, well, Joseph was their younger brother. That's right. But their problem was with God's authority. <laughs> You see, when we have a problem with our earthly authority, we also have a problem with our heavenly authority. 
How we respond to earthly authority is going to go a long way to determine how we respond to heavenly authority. Now, at this time, Joseph was not obviously the authority in their life, but he was going to be the authority. And God was revealing to him <coughs> some things that were going to happen. And they are like, no way, Jose, we're not going to do this. You're just our little squirt brother. There's no way we're going to bow down to you. There's no way we're going to do these things. And no matter how hard they tried to thwart this plan, as you go through and read through the story, God ultimately had his way and will. Why? Because God's authority always is going to rule. So let's look here about having a healthy view of authority. Let's pray. And we'll get right into the message. Our Father, we come before you and pray that you will open our hearts and our understanding to the scriptures. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to see some important things and how we can have a very biblical view of authority. The authority you've placed in our life. And we all have authority. We all, uh, sometimes we are in a place of authority. But Lord, we, more important than anything else, we need to have a right view of authority when it comes to how we view you and how we respond to the things that you do in our life. And Father, I just pray that you will uh, guide and direct our time together now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we all have authority of some kind in our life. What are some authorities we have right now? Boss. A boss. We have a boss. Okay. If you have a job, you probably have a boss somewhere. That is your authority. What else? Police officers. Police officers. I was thinking of that one. <laughs> there are traffic laws you have to obey, uh, or you're going to pay the price. You know, somewhere along the way. What are the authorities? A wife. A wife. <laughs> you got a wife. You got that. <laughs> now there are authority though in in the home, and of course the husband is the authority. You have parents. Uh, parents are the authority until uh, the Bible says that a man, when he gets married, he leaves father and mother and cleaves unto his wife. But there are family uh, relationships that have authority. There's a lot of types of authority we could have. You know, we're in the midst of tax season. The government has passed a lot of tax laws. And every year it seems like it gets a little more complicated. But uh, the tax laws are there because the government has authority. So we all are going to be under authority of some kind. Now, our response, how we respond to authority is very important to God. Do we respond in a correct biblical way? Because there are times when we don't always feel like responding in a right way. An example, a police officer starts to pull you over. You've gone a little too fast or something down the road. The way we respond to authority can affect us. It can affect us emotionally. Yeah, I know there are some people who uh, are very sensitive and uh, you know, just even saying something to them, even not even in a certain way, but just saying something to them in a correction thing, I mean, they just break down and start crying. You know, they can't handle it. It affects them emotionally. Uh, it affects some people mentally. You know, you start, you get a uh, passive police officer. I remember, matter of fact, I was driving down 219 the other day, and I wasn't even paying attention. I was daydreaming, I was thinking about something, you know, in the church and just going along and, and uh, saw, as I passed, I saw the sheriff over here on the right, and I was like, oh, you know, that's nice seeing them out and about, and I had to look down and see my speedometer, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> And I thought, well, Lord, it's in your hands. He pulls me over. I was speed, and I'll just you know, pay the ticket, pay the fine. You know? And uh, if not, then I'm just going to count my blessings and move on. You know? But it could have affected me mentally. I could have been worried about that and been fretting over that. Sometimes that happens. But it can also, at times, if we respond in a right way or even in a wrong way, it can affect us physically. You, know, you have a problem at work. We talk about the boss. You have a problem at work, a problem with your authority. Uh, you can actually get physically ill uh, because of having a wrong response to authority and some of the things that happen. So our response to authority is very, very important. Now, the question we must ask is who is ultimately in charge of everything? Yeah. We talked a little bit about this. God is. And we talked a little bit about it in the adult Sunday school class on Sunday. 
But who is ultimately in charge? Take your Bibles and turn to chapter 39 of Genesis. We're going to see a few passages here because it's important for us to see biblically who is in charge in every situation. Genesis 39 and verse number 6. Here again is a story of Joseph. He has now been sold into slavery. He is in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife is pursuing him, trying to get him to have an immoral relationship with him. Uh, Joseph was apparently a, a good-looking guy. Potiphar's wife was probably a good-looking woman. And uh, she's looking for an opportunity. She's a very loose woman. And then look what it says here in Genesis 39 and verse number 6. It says, And he left all he had. This is talking to Potiphar. And he left all he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, what if not what is with me in the house? And he hath committed all they have to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. Now listen to what he says here. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see, he didn't say, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar, your husband? You see, he saw something here about authority. Joseph was under Potiphar's authority. But ultimately, he knew that if he was going to sin, it wasn't just going to be against Potiphar. It was going to be mainly against God Almighty. You see, that's having a healthy view of authority. Notice, turn if you would to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm going to have you turn here to a couple places uh, looking at these verses because I think it's important for us to see these things. The book of Ecclesiastes after the book of Proverbs. The very last two verses in the book. Ecclesiastes written by Solomon, written uh, towards the end of his life. He uh, had gone away from God, got away from God, and then he wrote about vanity and emptiness. And listen to what he says here, the very last two verses in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, a couple questions for you. Who, or let me ask this, what will God judge? What does it say in verse 14 that he will judge? For God shall do what? <clears throat> Bring every work. It's not just good works. It's not just a few bad works. For God shall bring every work into judgment. Doesn't matter what it is. He's going to bring every work into judgment. So, uh, also, is there anything that we can do, anything a human being can do, that God will not see? Absolutely not. No. Why? Because he's bringing every work into judgment. And notice what else it says. With every secret thing. You may have something that you're hiding from somebody else and think, well, it's okay. Nobody else knows about this. You know, blah, 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 blah. God sees everything. You see, ultimately, he is the authority. Just like Joseph when he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. He realized no matter who else would know about this, God would know about it. That was the important thing. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 10 in the New Testament, the, Matthew, the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, and look at verse 37. Now, Jesus is speaking here. And he's talking about a household. In Matthew 10, 37, it says, He that loveth father or mother more than, what's the next word? Me. Me. He that loveth father and mother, and I hope you love your mom and dad. Maybe your mom and dad's already passed away in heaven, but I hope you love them. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter. Now, if you have children, you probably love your children. 
He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see, Jesus Christ here is commanding more love and more loyalty from us than what we would normally give to our family. You know, you've heard the saying, blood is thicker than water. And uh, you can, sometimes people joke around about it. I know it was like this when I was growing up. And my family, our, my brothers and sisters, you know, we all fought like cats and dogs. And, and that was just something we, we always did. But if anybody else outside of our family messed with any one of us, you better look out. It didn't matter if we were mad at each other, but at that point, we were on the same side. And nobody was going to be able to say anything against us. Why? Because blood is thicker than water. But Jesus is saying here that if we love father or mother or brother or sister more than me, we're not worthy of it. You see, he is saying, because I am the ultimate authority, you need to give your love and loyalty to me. That's what he's trying to say here. Look also, if you would, in Romans chapter 13. God wants us to have a healthy view of authority in our life because when we do, we will respond to our earthly authority the correct way and we will respond accordingly to our heavenly authority in a correct way. Look at Romans chapter 13 and verse number 1. It says, Let every soul that means nobody is excluded from this. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of who? God. God. Now, I don't know if you voted for uh, President Joe Biden or not. I personally don't like the guy. I think he's always been a liar. And uh, do you like him? Well, that's between you and God. But he's been a liar ever since he's been in politics. But you know what? He is the president. And God's the one to put him there. Right. You can talk about cheating all you want. I think there was a lot of shenanigans and things that went on. But God could have stopped it any time. Right. I have a responsibility as an American citizen to cast my vote. But ultimately, God's the one who determines mm -hmm. who's going to be in office. Ultimately, God determines who is going to be uh, the governor on our sit you near know, the, uh, the Board of Education. I mean, people who are in positions, ultimately God is in control. That's what it's saying there. It says, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. You say, you know, that doesn't mean that the people who are in power have God's blessings. What that means is they are there because that's who we deserve. They are ordained of God. That's what that means. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, that doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. That means you're going to receive judgment. That's what that means. So what God is saying here with this passage is he is ultimately in control of governments. He is the one who sets kings up and he's the one who puts kings down. He is in control. Turn to one other passage, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. What we're talking about here ultimately is God's, uh, this is a part of this, is God's sovereignty. God is in control. He is all powerful. Colossians chapter 3. And look at verse 23. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. <clears throat> It says, and whatsoever you do, now this is speaking to Christians here, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So the question is this, who does the Christian ultimately serve? Christ. Christ. The best way we can serve Christ is by serving one another. The best way we can serve Christ is by realizing he is the master. You see, that is God's authority. Ultimately, he is in charge. God is the final authority in every area of our life, in the personal areas of our life. And when it comes to our family life, God is ultimately in charge. And when it comes to our public life, God is ultimately the one that's in charge. 
And since God is our ultimate authority, does he have the right to demand we change something in our lives if it's needed? Yeah. 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 You think about your children. You know, when the kids are young, you ever had a, a young person say to you, now none of my kids have ever said this. <laughs> I think they know better. But uh, I've had some kids say this to me. Who are you to tell me what to do? I just think you little pipsqueak. <laughs> I could squash you in a moment. <laughs> but you know what? What's the real problem? The real problem is the way they respond to me is the same way they're responding to God. You see, God is the ultimate authority. Yeah. And if they're responding in a wrong way to an earthly authority, they're going to respond the wrong way to a heavenly authority as well. And that's what God is trying to teach us through his word. So if, if uh, one of my kids were doing something and I said, hey, I don't want you doing this, I have the authority to tell them to do that. Why? Because I am the authority. When you are the one who has the authority, then yes, you can tell the one who's under your authority, this is what I want you to do. This is the way you need to do this. So God has every right to demand that we change something in our life if there's something that needs change. Now, why can God demand this authority? Well, let me just go through a few things here quickly. We're not going to look at the verses that go with this, Bible verses. Why can he demand this authority? Well, first of all, he's the creator. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1.3 talks about Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You see, he's the creator. When you create something, you have the right to dictate what that thing does. Parents kind of create <laughs> children. They're born to that family. I always tell parents this. You need to realize that child is born into your family. You are not born into its family. So don't let that child dictate to you when it's going to eat, when it's going to sleep, when it's going to do these things. You have to get that thing, that child on the schedule, and it has to learn to submit to your authority. And that's the way it works. And God... Uh, and this is not just with God as he creates us, but this goes to somebody who maybe writes a document. They hold a copyright on it. Why? They have the authority to determine what happens to that material because they created that material in, in a sense. And this happens with a lot of things. So because he is creator, he has the authority. People who are business owners, they can determine how their business is going to be run. Why? Because they created that business. They started that business. And God is the same way. Because he is creator, he can demand the authority. Also, he has, since he has no beginning or no end, he's timeless. A person's age and their experience often gives them some authority. I've taught our kids that if you want to find out uh, how to do something, go to somebody who has experience in that field. They know what you're talking about. Or sometimes it's just good to go talk to some older folks. Sit down and listen you can learn a lot of things. Yeah. Because in a few years, they learn some stuff themselves. You see, with age and experience comes authority. Well, guess what? God has them both. He has no beginning and no end. Also, because he is omnipotent, this means he is all-powerful. Power gives authority. Now, think about this in a bad sense. Remember back when you were a kid? The person who had the charge of the swing set was always the one who was the biggest person, the strongest person. They were the one in control of the swing set. Why? Because they had the power. You know, every time I would try, I was a little pit squeak when I was younger, and every time I tried to override that power, uh, this big guy, I mean, he was just a big old brute. He was one year older than I was. He would always put me down, and it seemed like the teachers never were paying attention. Every time he would shove my face into the dirt, I uh, never paid attention. Now, the good news is, as I grew up, we were in the same class in high school. I hadn't seen him for years. And he was a senior. I was a junior. We had the same class. He sat right in front of me. And he finally realized who I was. And by this time, I was a foot and a half taller than him. <laughs> he was almost like, yes, sir. Yes, oh, you're old. 
Well, I treated you horrible. Well, I, I hope you forgive me again for all that. And he was just, you know, why? Because now I had the power according. You see, with, comes, with power comes authority. Well, God, because he is omnipotent, he has all authority. I remember one time I was uh, working at the census there in Tennessee, and uh, I was the person over all the field operations in 22 counties in East Tennessee. And uh, so I had to know how to do all these procedures and all this stuff. Well, there was a lady who came into the office. She was one of the listers. She was actually about three levels below me. And she came into the office and she was talking to a couple of my office supervisors that were under me as well. She was asking a question. She's like, well, I don't know how to do this. You know, I had this problem. This came up and she's in the bubble and she's going off. And I'm sitting there at the desk. I'm typing away you know, for something else. And I heard what she was saying. And I just, I blurted out to her. I said, here's what you need to do. This is the documentation. This is what you have to follow. And she's like, and who are you? And I just went on. I was like, well, I'm Walt. You're who? I said, I'm Walt. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. She's like, I didn't realize who you were. I didn't change anything. I was still the same person she was talking to the first time. What changed? It was the power. I had power to fire, to hire, to do other things. That changed the authority. You see, power has authority. So uh, everyone sees that. Everyone understands that. With God, he is all-powerful. So guess what? He has authority. Amen. He is also omnipresent. His presence gives authority. Remember back when you were in school? You, what happened when you had a substitute teacher? <laughs> All chaos breaks loose. But it was different when the real teacher was there, wasn't it? Why? Because there was some authority. When the teacher was present, there was authority. On ball teams, you know, we sometimes goof off and carry on. But when the coach showed up, it changed. Same thing in the home. My mom sometimes would say, wait till you're... Father comes home. You see, with the presence is authority. And God is everywhere present at the same time. He has all authority. Something else that God has, another reason he has authority is because he's omniscient. He knows everything. You've heard the saying before, knowledge is power. You've heard maybe the story about the, the person who was a heating air conditioning guy. Someone was having a problem with their air conditioner and Call up the heating air conditioning guy, and uh, you know he came to stop by, and, and he looked at the machine. The guy's explained the problem to him. He's like, "This thing keeps acting up." You know, and he's going through this whole thing, telling him what's going on. The guy goes over, looks at the situation, looks at what's going on, goes back into his truck, comes out with a hammer, taps on the bottom, puts the hammer back, starts writing the bill. The thing's running now, everything's going great, and the bill's like, you know, one hundred and twenty dollars. The guy's like, what? You were just here three minutes? You came and got it? I could have gotten my hammer. I could have had that hammer and tapped on that place. Why is the bill 120? I want an itemized bill right now. So the guy said, okay. Itemized bill. $3 for labor. $117 for knowing where to hit. <laughs> you see, knowledge is power. So it happens with every area of life. And God is all knowledge. He has all knowledge of the past, all knowledge of the present, all knowledge of the future. Sometimes, you ever think you ever wish you could know the future? Think, man, if I knew, I used to think this when I would play ball and I would be pitching or something. You're like, if I knew what this guy was going to do, then boy, I'd be really handy to know. Why? Because of knowledge is power. But see, God knows all that stuff. He knows the future, He knows the present, He knows everything. Also, because God is all wise. He has this authority. The Bible calls him counselor. He is counselor. He always gives the right advice. He never leads somebody astray. We often consult other people to get counsel from them, but that, that wisdom is limited. God's wisdom is unlimited. He's also holy. To be holy means to be separate, separated from sin. And because he's holy, he's kind of like, a judge in a case who is completely separated, separated from everything in the case. He cannot be corrupted by uh, bribes or anything else. He's completely separate from all these things. So he's going to be fair and impartial. You see, he's holy. 
He's also righteous and just. He's always going to do what is best for us. When you have sports teams, you put your best players on the field, don't you? Because they're going to give you the most power to be able to win. And God, because he is righteous and just, he's always going to do what's good. And therefore, he has the power. And that power is authority. So where do we find, uh, as our authority, as God being our authority, where do we find God's demands? Where do we find out what it is he wants us to do? Well, God communicates to us. I'm just going to go over these things here quickly. God communicates to us through a few avenues. He communicates to us through nature, through history, and through conscience. But all of these things is how he generally speaks to us. This is called general revelation. Nature, history, and conscience. But there's a very specific way he likes to speak to us. And this is the way God speaks to us most of the time. And it's th it would call this special revelation. It's through his word. Amen. That is how he communicates his authority to us to say, hey, you're doing something wrong. I have the authority. This is how I want you to fix this. The word of God is full of this. Deuteronomy 29 29 is a great verse. Psalm 119, there's several verses there. Uh, verses 104 through 105. Uh, verse 130, verse 160. And then we know, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. These are all wonderful verses. But the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1, 3, that God has given us everything that we need to live this life and live it his way. Why? Because he has ultimate authority. And he's going to direct us through the written revelation he's given to us. Now, with all that, how do we have a healthy view of authority? And these are just a few points. I'm just going to give to you quickly. One, it starts with recognizing his authority in your life. He has all authority. Yeah. You have to recognize it. This is how you, first of all, start having a healthy view of authority. Realize God is the ultimate authority. Secondly, learn how he expects us to behave based on his authority. That's why you need to know the Bible, getting God's word. That tells us how he expects us to behave. And then thirdly, realize how we respond to our earthly authority is also how we're going to respond to his authority. Remember, he's the one who sets kings up and puts them down. He might give you a cantankerous boss, but realize God's in control. He can change that situation anytime he wants. There's nothing wrong with you praying that he does change it. But realize he is ultimately in control. And then lastly, and this is probably the most difficult thing, is you need to give up your right to be in control. What do you mean by that? Well, we feel like I have a right to be treated this way. I have a right to be treated fairly. You need to give up that right because it's not really a right. There's another couple Bible words that are good to go with that. One is submit. Another is yield. That's what you need to do. Those things that you think you have a right to, give them to God. To God, you know, I didn't, my boss yelled at me today and, and uh, I got blamed for something I didn't do. I don't feel that that was my right. But you know what? This is in your hands. You're in control of it. I'm giving that right to you. I don't have a right to be... Uh, treated fairly at work. I don't have a right for any of this. I'm just going to leave it in your hands. And what you do is you have yielded that authority to God, which is his anyway. And that allows him to work out all kinds of circumstances. But when we take matters into our own hands and we want to have the authority, we want to maybe respond to our earthly authority in the wrong way because we want to have control, that's when you're going to mess it all up. You see, we can tie God's hands. We tie God's hands when we refuse to take our hands off of something. I was telling somebody this the other day. They were talking about a problem they were going through. And I said, one thing you better be careful. I said, I understand you want to help in this situation. I understand that. But you better be careful you're not interfering with what God is trying to do in this other person's life. 
because you're in very dangerous territory. You better let God work that situation out first. And if he wants you to help them, then he'll work it out. He'll show you exactly what you need to do. But you need to realize, ultimately, God has the authority to handle it his way. We need to have a healthy view of authority in our life. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures. And we thank you, Lord, that you do have total control over everything in our lives. If, Lord, we would just yield that control like you desire for us to. Lord, so often we see something that we're kind of like Uzzah there in the Old Testament. We see the ark starting to tip over and we want to fix it. We want to have our hand on the ark and, and set it up straight. But Lord, that wasn't your will. And Lord, just like with Joseph's brothers, as they did not want to submit to any authority. They had a problem already with authority, but didn't even realize it. But Joseph's dreams did come true. They did eventually bow down to him, just like the dream said. Because, Lord, you are in control. We need to allow you to work out these things in our life and realize because you are the creator, because you're all-powerful and you're everywhere present, Lord, you deserve to have all this authority. And the wonderful thing is, when you have that authority, you only want what is best for us. That's the good thing. And I like what the Word of God says, no good thing will He withhold and then to walk uprightly. So Lord, help us simply to obey the Word of God. Help us to walk uprightly. And then, Lord, we know that all the good things that you have for us will come our way. Father, we just pray and ask these things now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 253, we're going to sing a few verses. God spoke to your heart, but won't you come? 253. serious about the relationship and this not be something that's done in vain and I know God will use it in a great way so we just need to trust him for that but let's dismiss here in word of prayer I'm going to ask Doug if he might close in our service in prayer our Father God we thank you for this midnight service and for the message that you give us through the pastor and for every word Lord that's been presented to us help us to use it in our daily life so Lord remember that indeed it's not us that's over anybody that you're over everything. God help us to submit, surrender. Lord, we better quit because of it. We ask, Lord, that the lost to be saved. 
for each name on these cards up here. Unless they've called on you, Lord, there's a bunch of names up here. A bunch of people going to all the place God help. God give them another chance. Send somebody to them. Get somebody to them that will talk to them kindly, lovingly. They need to change. They need to get their act together. They need to get saved before it's eternally too late. God help us to do our part. We don't know these people. I still continue to pray for them. Ask you to work. Send somebody that does know them to. God, we pray you forgive us for sins or shortcomings in life. We thank you for the pastor, for his family, for our church family, for the love they had to hear one or another and for each other. God, we ask you to give us safety as we travel from this place, our homes, and the place we abide. God, help us to be mindful that, Lord, we need to give you all of it and not try to save anybody. Lord, we many times we ask for a request pray, Lord, for things to be done. But when we get to the top of that ladder, Lord, we just bring it right back down with us. We don't turn it over to you as we should. Ask God that you just help us as a church to stay together, to stay in unity, to stay in love, and have the desire in our hearts and minds that uh, salvation is the name of the game. Uh, we ask you to forgive us where we come short. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night.